All right, I'm gonna start this. Okay. Hey, everybody that's out there. Um, we are going to taste these three sparkling wines. It's gonna be fantastic, super excited. Um, for folks that are new to our virtual tastings, I am Nate Norfolk. I am the Wine and Spirits Director of Ray's Wine and Spirits here. I am a certified sommelier. Um, I love drinking the bubbles. That's like my desert island thing. If I were going to pick one thing that I could only drink for the rest of my life, it would be actual real champagne there. Um, so this is going to get a little bit geeky. Um, I try to have some, uh, brevity with this, but it's always really tough because there's like, like how sparkling wines are made is, is pretty technical and there's a lot of different methods. We're going to cover the two main ways that sparkling wines are made and like the two main ways quality sparkling wines are made because there's a... There's other things like you can just inject CO2 into them and make them like you're making soda. But we're going to cover like how classic like Prosecco specifically is made in the Charmat method, which is like in a tank. And then we're going to do the champ the champagne method, which is something called the traditional method. I'll probably talk about a couple other things. Folks that have uh, um, if you have a YouTube you know, if you're logged into YouTube, you can chat along with this. I really encourage that. Um, when we used to do these things live, the beauty and the fun of the whole event was a lot of it is the the just people ask great questions and there's interaction. And I and my job is just kind of be like the MC and pick the wines. So um, hopefully everybody gets this as being somewhat educational. Um, I'm going to, each time I'm going to open these up sep Usually I pour everything first. This though, I'm going to open each wine separately as we go along only because I think there's folks out there that probably want a little bit of a tutorial on, on how to comfortably open sparkling wine. I know a lot of us just do it and there very much is a correct methodology to it. Um, regardless if it's, you know, something that's like, you know, five, six bucks or, you know, a hundred plus dollar bottle of vintage champagne. There, there is a really correct way to do it without hopefully spilling it all over the place. I still screw it up myself once in a while and my kids laugh at me and I've got a bunch of dumb jokes I get to tell over and over about it. So be prepared. Um, let's see if I, I get the way the PowerPoint works, right? Let's see. Oh, Hi, Nate. Oh, no, I've opened all of the wines already. Lisa, it's it's cool. I know you, Lisa. You're super good. If you open these up already, that that's that's you. That's awesome. Good. I'm more going to open them each on my own just to show people how to open the damn things. So no, no problem. Um, Brohamid Eric. Oh, here we go. OK, so the first wine we're going to do is I've got you'll see at the bottom. We've got these lined up left to right in the order that we're going to taste them. And this is Villa Marcello Prosecco. Um, and Prosecco, as folks know, th first and foremost, the folks that bought this, this is like the craziest deal out there. This is like, this is normally 20 plus dollar a bottle Prosecco. And we've got on sale at Ray's for $10. And it's, it's, um, this is classic Prosecco. It's from an area called uh, Treviso. But we'll notice also that it's, um, I'm going back to the map. This is a vintage wine, meaning it all comes from one year. Many, many sparkling wines are a blend of grapes grown over the course of multiple years. This is somewhat of an anomaly. Most Prosecco is made in a rather industrial process and going to be a blend from a few different years. So, um... That being said, if you're not sipping already, you sh you're going to be really soon. We're going to open this guy up. I want to I want to show folks too like maybe like this is hard for me to see myself. I'm doing it. Like usually most sparkling wines, there's like this is called the foil, this top part, and a lot of them have like usually have some way to pull the foil or something that's relatively obvious that there's a perforation of some type here. 
and I'm getting it. This is this one wasn't so. I, half of you probably opened these, or almost all of you have. And one thing I want to want to make sure that we do, and I'm trying to get my right the right angle here. Like, remember, you know, these their contents are under pressure here. So, you know, uh, Prosecco is is made predominantly from a grape called Glera, G L E R A, and it can just be made in this northeastern part of Italy. I've got the cursor here, and we look at, here's the little, here's the Italian map subset. This area in yellow down here is called the Veneto, and Prosecco can be made throughout the Veneto and, uh, and Friuli, okay, which is the eastern, you know, east of the Veneto. So, um, you know, all the way up into the border with Slovenia. This, this comes from a specific area called Treviso, which is kind of um, just north of Venice, actually. Um, and Prosecco has a couple different subregions. Up until whew, 20, 2012 or 13, I can't remember the exact date, you used to be able to make Prosecco throughout Italy, and the grape was called Prosecco, and the people that originally made it in this area, specifically the Veneto in northeastern Italy, they started to get pretty bummed out because people, there were winemakers in Sicily and in Puglia in southern parts of Italy making really industrial Prosecco and undercutting the folks who originally made it. The, uh, the original producers lobbied hard enough to get it so now Prosecco is just limited to this area of Italy. It's a, in, in my mind, this is a, 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 a triumph of uh, um, a classic wine region really um, doing something to protect the integrity of the product. So, um, cause there was, there was some bad 10, 12 years ago, there was kind of garbage Prosecco on the market. Now it's really rare to find Prosecco under $10 a bottle wholesale. Um, and Prosecco is much cheaper than actual real champagne because it's made, um, it's made in a manner that it, it only takes a few months typically to make it. Whereas a uh, actual champagne that we'll taste later, it takes a minimum. It has to be aged a minimum of 15 months in bottle where this Prosecco is probably about four. It's, it's aged on the lees and I'll get to how these are made, uh, on the lees in a tank, in a large tank for, for probably like three or four months. Um, so when we open any kind of sparkling wine, as you see, I took the foil off, right? And then this, this wire part is called the cage. And I'm going to hold this at a 45 degree angle, right? And then I'm going to turn the, um, the wire on the cage, right? Got it. And then the 45 degree angle here is because I'm, I'm kind of displacing the air inside the bottle. I'm spreading it out over the, a, a larger space in the bottle. So it's not all what pressure doesn't all just go right into the top of the neck, right? That's what the 45 degree angle here is about. And typically like, like when you get into, this is what we would call, this is a, this is in, made in the Charmant method, named after a Dr. Charmant, C-H-A-R-M-A-N-T. I'm already getting really pedantic, but, but this is made differently than actual champagne. So it's not under as much pressure. It's probably like two to three times the atmospheric pressure where most champagne is more about like about five. Um, I'm turning the cork and the bottle in two different directions very slowly. And the, the joke, and, you know, forgive me, everybody has heard this if you've ever done a champagne glass with me, a, uh, a champagne bottle opening should sound like a nun farting in church. You should barely be able to hear it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, da, da, da. I'm, and check this out. I'm using just regular wine stems. Um, to pour these, I'm, this is my, and this isn't, you know, this, a lot's changed as far as consumers and glassware go, um, in the last 15, 20 years with wine, most serious sparkling wine producers now recommend that you, instead of using the big, the super tall flute that we were used to, um, I still have a dozen flutes at home and I let my kids, I put soda in them for my kids and stuff like that. But I like never use them for sparkling wine anymore because that super tall flute, the beauty of it is it really maintains the bubbles 
in the um, in a sparkling wine. But it's really hard to smell from that, man. Like and and like you're putting it to your mouth. It's got a little tiny hole. So when you have that big, tall, fluted champagne glass, it, you don't really get to sniff it because it kind of goes in your mouth without your nose even getting around it. So another thing I'm going to do, I'm going to pour this, and I want everybody to notice when I'm pouring, you want to do a slow, continuous pour, and then do a little twist at the end. And I don't, I got one little half a drop that got spilled. If I were doing this in a restaurant and it was, you know, we were, the game, you know, game time was on, I would have a serviette. I'd have some type of of cloth with me to make sure that I, w I would hold over the top of the bottle just in case when I do open it, I do have a little, you know, a little too much excitement in the bubbles. All right, we're going to drink this. Everybody's sniffing this at home. Remember, this is the Villa Marcello Prosecco. I got you the big Prosecco map. I'm going to, we're going to go back and forth between these things. Don't worry. Marcello's kind of like, this isn't, there isn't an actual, the, Marcello, the name is a combination of like Mare, um, Sea, Cello, like the sky, like where the sea and the sky come together. It's kind of how the Veneto is. Remember this, and this has got some age on it. Some people probably have 2016 vintage of this, and maybe some of you have 2015. I'm not, I'm not sure if it was all uniform. Oh, I'm drinking. I'm having, I'm having some real sips. You know what? I gotta get something to. I'm gonna. One moment, folks. I hope everybody at home is gonna drink like, you know, three full glasses of, of bubbles while we're doing this. But I'm not, cause somebody's gotta drive the bus, folks. Man. All right, I'll go back a little bit to how this is made too. I'm taking the nose on this and it, it really reminds me of, um, and it, well, it reminds me of just like, like heirloom style, like really good, like fresh, fresh apples that are more on the leaning on the green side. Um, it, but not quite Granny Smith. So I want everybody to notice, like, there is a bubble to this when you've poured it, but it's not, like, it doesn't have a real intense mousse. Like, there's not, like, a head that's still hanging out. But it's still, it's still, um, it's still bubbling a little bit. Um, yeah, it's total, it's a total, like, bright green apple. I get, I get yeastiness, but a really, like, 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 fresh-baked bread. And it sounds so generic when you say it, but it, it's to me there's like a, a kind of seltzer quality and a little bit of a a kind of sea breeze, saline kind of thing to it. So this has got a little bit of age on it for prosecco, and prosecco prosecco is meant to be consumed really um, upon release. Um, there there's some exceptions to that, but but really ninety five percent of prosecco that's that's out there you should be drinking like. It's in the store. It's there for you to drink. Um, the beauty of Prosecco as just a sparkling wine is that it's a it's inexpensive. Um, it's rare to find them over thirty dollars a bottle. That it's out there, but you know most of them live in this ten to twenty five dollar range. And there's very good Prosecco at that you know in the in around the twenty dollar twenty to twenty five dollar range. Um, this is what we would call a brute style, it, meaning it's dry. It has very, very little uh, residual sugar. Um, whereas some Prosecco can be extra dry, which is confusingly about 1% to 2% residual sugar, meaning like in a solution, uh, in the solution of the liquid, somewhere between 1% and 2% of it is still sugar that hasn't been fermented. So it can be lightly sweet. That's kind of the appeal of Prosecco sometimes too, is that it can be just a little sweet. So you can have it with like, I love Prosecco with, um, with foods that have a little bit of heat. I, I especially like it with like, um, things like poke, um, or like, you know, sushi that might be like uh, spicy salmon or spicy tuna, um, you know, basic stuff like that. Thai food, 
Northern Indian dishes. Um, whereas like a champagne, like from champagne, I typically wouldn't have, um, you know, a dry style champagne. I wouldn't, I wouldn't pair with those dishes. I do sometimes, but I find Prosecco is really a slightly sweet Prosecco is really gorgeous with that kind of food. Obviously this is meant for, to be paired with like crudo or just, um, antipasta, um, and Italian cuisine across the board. Um, but, but there, like I say to folks all the time, s- dry sparkling wines go with everything but dessert. So they're the, probably the most versatile style of wine out there. Oh, wait. Oh, some people are talking. Bradley Wells. I've got my nose buried in my flute. Oh, damn, dog. Just regular old white wine glasses, man. Ah, and Bradley Wells, also 2015 Prosecco in my bottle. I have to remove the cage to get to the cork out. Ah, oh, really? yeah, you don't, that, you don't have to take, like, yeah, I'll, with the next one, I'll, I'll show you guys. You don't have to take that cage part off of the cork. You kind of do it. It's like a all, it's like a all in one, you know, like, like, I don't know. There's some, I, I, there's some dirty analogy out there somewhere, but like you just take the cage and the cork off at the same time. Um, feel free to elaborate in the comments if you want to. I'm, I'm going to try to have some kind of uh, professional poise here. Man, pretty good. So one thing we're, we're going to look at. So this is called the tank method, the way that Prosecco is made. And this is why it's why Prosecco is so much less expensive than than actual champagne. So we're we first we make a make a wine like we would harvest grapes from a vineyard and we press those grapes to get the juice and then we add yeast to it. The cl- I mean, this is just basic, basic wine stuff. Right. And then we we um, it's it's. It's you put it in the autoclave, which is just a a tank, uh, uh, um, a pressure resistant tank, right? Now here's here's what goes on to, that that differs from champagne. At this point, we've just got wine that has no bubbles, so we put it into a second tank, right? And um, it, and and we've at that point we're adding yeast and sugar to that again to start a secondary fermentation and maintain the pressure because that second tank is 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 the autoclave which is like not going to um you know it's going to maintain the pressure then we filter it um to get the sediment out so it's not it's not cloudy at all and then we um and then then sometimes a little bit of sugar is added to it and or um and or wine, like must, like unfermented wine, um, and then it's bottled. And this process with Prosecco takes, takes you know, a few months to maybe half a year. Sometimes we sit it with the yeast for a little bit longer. Folks can do it longer if they want. Um, uh, there's, it's rare. It, people can make it, make it in the bottle if they want to, do a secondary fermentation in the bottle. But mostly this second step, where it's fermented in this goes gets the bubbles from being under pressure in the tank with yeast and sugar added is really really what separates it from from champagne whereas a champagne and the two other sparkling wines they go through this secondary fer- fermentation the way they get the bubbles from in individual bottles which is incredibly labor intensive so um ah and then somebody asks, is kava made similar to Prosecco? No, kava is, is made in the traditional method, right? So kava is made just like champagne is. Kava goes through a secondary fermentation in the bottle. That's why kava is really, really intensely sparkling and has um, is under a lot of pressure, just like a champagne would be. Um, Anybody, th- any thoughts on this, the way it tastes, what people think about it? This is, I find this to be like compelling, complex Prosecco. Um, it's got, it's got a little bit of richness. It's on the more, um, I know means, I mean, it's white, it's sparkling white wine. So I'm really going to call it full body, but there is a slight creaminess to it. One thing I also want to remind folks is like, man, 
what's kind of go- cool about even a lot of dry sparkling wines is that they're relatively low in alcohol. So this is 11% ABV, which is like, you know, most red wines from California or even white wines for that matter from warmer places are in like this 13 to 15% alcohol land. You can kind of drink a little bit more of this if you want to than, you know, and not get as tore up. Um, I hope I covered that with a kava. I was thinking about doing a kava too, but I had such a cool other um, sparkling wine to kind of do as the middle thing that, and I'm putting the cart before the horse. Um, any kind of questions about this? Um, ah, oh, Bradley Wells says, I'm used to sweeter Prosecco, but this is smooth and very nice. Yeah, so uh, like I said when we first started this whole thing out, like sparkling wine is a is a pretty vast and complex subject matter. Um, some Some Prosecco is sweeter than this. I really wanted to um, pick wines that were all done in a brute style, which I'll get to in um, just a moment. Like, like I wanted them to be all about as dry as each other. If I do a really wide range of wines, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll try to have different levels of sweetness. This I thought we could show off more um, terroir variations and winemaking variations by presenting these when they're about as uh, sweet as each other. Um, or, you know, has the, have the same level as dryness. I'm saying sweet, but, you know, they're, they're as dry, roughly as dry across the board, these three wines are. Man. All right. I, um, I, get, I, get creamy, I get the creaminess, but I like a bubblier mouthfeel like Champagne and Cava. Awesome, awesome comment, U.S. fan TV. I don't know who you are out there with your interesting, interesting YouTube name, but wonderful question, wonderful comment. Um, yeah, for sure. That This is the big difference because this is made in a tank, and that's how it gets the bubbles. It, it's not it, – it just doesn't have as much pressure – as wine that goes through that secondary fermentation in the bottle to get the bubbles. Um, Prosecco's a little, and because of that, it's much less expensive to make than, than champagne. Um, this Glera grape really, and the Prosecco grape is indigenous to this part of northeastern Italy. Um, and over really the second half of the 20th century, people started to grow it other places. Um, the rise of popularity of Prosecco in the U.S. is really a phenomenon of the last 20 years here. I mean, um, I've been in the wine business for 20 years, roughly, and this was something that was kind of an afterthought for, um, up until about, until roughly like 15, 20 years ago. Now there isn't an Italian restaurant in the world that doesn't serve it. And because it is just such a great easy drinking, ultimately pleasing starter wine um, that really makes a pretty great aperitif too. Okay, so that's Villa Marcello um, Prosecco. Um, ah, yes, my name is Chris. Sorry, I'm signed in as my YouTube channel. Thank you, Chris. Uh, you could have maintained the anonymity. I mean, sometimes that's the spice of life too. Um, perfect. Any other questions about the Prosecco before we move on? Ta-da! I don't know what else I need to really elaborate on here. Veneto, northeastern Italy, just north of Verona, or just, sorry, just north of Venice, uh, technically east of Verona, I believe. Yep. Um, oh, and then I, I, I did, once again, I talked about how these wines are all brute, which is a French term uh, used to describe the driest of champagnes and sparkling wines. Um, these will be almost universally less than 1% residual sugar. They're, they're, there's very little perceptible sweetness in, in, in these wines. When we do get to the brute style. Um, Prosecco, confusingly, Prosecco, can, Prosecco and champagnes can be made in a style called extra dry, um, all sparkling wines can, that is sweeter than brute. Extra dry is sweeter than brute. 
I won't go too deep into that. Here, this, here's this. The next thing we're gonna try here is this Antec. Uh, it's a Blanquette de la Mue. Um, I'll also talk about this and I'll probably go back, but I'm gonna get this if we see the middle one. Um, now we get into the, um, now we're gonna talk about traditional method. Um, interestingly, I'm gonna bump back and forth. So this is, this is the, um, ah, can you touch on the DOC rating for Prosecco? Oh boy, okay. Woo. Okay, I'm gonna go back to that Prosecco map. So Bradley is asking a kind of geeky question, right? So in Italy, we'll we'll see that we see this map and we see what are called a DOC, which is Donomination Origin Controllata. That's what it stands for. It's the legal, it's the legal seal for a wine for all the Italian wine regions, and there's hundreds and hundreds of them, right? And then we have what's called a DOCG. At, and the DOCG is like the Donomination Origin Controllata. Uh, I think it's whatever the equivalent, the uh, Italian equivalent of the word guarantee is. It's, um, it's, it's wines of um, wines from regions of classic styles and historical significance. Prosecco um, until about 15 years ago was just one DOC. And uh, subsequently, we've um, the the region you know the historic the st historically most significant regions are called Val do Beadene, which is its own like really really hard you know that's its own mouthful uh, and um, Asolo and uh, Conigliano um, and these are. Um, um, th this is the heartland. You'll see, uh, this is kind of classic in Italian wine regions. Chianti is very similar to this. You'll see, you see this map, and I usually make the, um, the, uh, um, the analogy of a, of a fried egg, right? We've got the whole area here. It's like the whites and the yolk together. But then we have the main area where, where people originally started doing whatever the style of wine is. And that kind of serves as the, you know, historical center. And usually the best vineyards are are located where we first started doing this. And subsequently, with the popularity of that style of wine increasing, the neighbors want to get in on the action. Um, and that's that's really, I hope that basically covers it. I would say, Bradley, like as in many wine regions, the best areas are um, south-facing slopes, um, typically in the northern hemisphere because they have a great exposure, better drainage, um, less likely to have frost. You know, there's a lot of advantages to a south-facing slope. Uh, particularly in uh, Conigliano, there is an area called Cartese, and uh, Cartese is is, is a, a very large. Um, single vineyard um, uh, within Conigliano um, in the Val d'Adene. And, and it is considered the, the greatest of Prosecco vineyards and will sometimes be made in a vintage style and occasionally be made in like, made like a champagne where it's bottle fermented. Um, and th those actually can be somewhat high in price. I really elaborated on that. Hopefully, um, We've had some, car I, I can't remember the last time we had a Cartese wine here in the store, but in the future, it, it's possible and they're, they're out there for me to buy um, and for you to buy. Um, and then, Bradley, I hope that we got to that. That was a lot of talk. Um, oh, Brendan Pancheri. Um, it has some nice legs on the drinking on the drinking side, is there any significance to that? Um, no, I mean, like, the the legs in a wine are really, uh, you know, from a combination of um, uh, residual sugar and, and alcohol. Like, when something has more residual sugar, it'll usually be really viscous and have a lot of legs, and it'll take a long time to kind of fall down. The same thing with, like, higher alcohol wines. So 
in my mind, this is actually pretty, like, these form some really uniform, really fast descending legs because it's dry and relatively low in alcohol. Good comment, though. And, and legs have nothing to do with the quality of a wine ever. All right, there we go. We talked about Brut, Dosage. This is the crazy thing. Like, this is really at the, at the very end when we make a sparkling wine, this is what we add to determine how sweet or dry, dry it is. It's one of those other things that separates a sparkling wine from a regular plain old wine that doesn't have bubbles. Just wanted to touch on that because it's, it, it, it's a word that comes up that I'll probably say and is, you know, happens. So we're, I'll, I'll show you guys what riddling is. And it's, it's how we get when we do the bottle fermenting of, of a um, sparkling wine. It's how we get the yeast out at the end. Um, and it's these, these, the racks are, um, I'll show you pictures of the racks pretty soon. So this work now we're going to open up the and if you haven't already, please do. We're going to open up the Antec. Um, it's, it's really called a Blanquette de Lemieux. That's a mouthful. Blanquette. Um, and this is, this is the area. This is interesting. This is the oldest sparkling wine region in France. So they've been, make, they've been making sparkling wine here since the 16th century. Um, and, and selling it. Um, since then, Antec is a, is a, is a moderately sized producer here. This is also a vintage wine, meaning it all comes from one year. Everybody should have 2016 of this wine and it's, uh, predominantly made from, um, a grape called Moussac. And that's why this is a Blanquette de la Mieux. It's made from the grape called Moussac. Okay. So I did the same thing. Sorry. I, I started getting, I got a little anxious, really thirsty here. Um, I took the, remember, I took the foil off and then I have the wire, the cage still on. Why don't I take the cage off? Well, as soon as I take that cage all the way off and then I have it just kind of this, this uh, cork just hanging out on its own. Dude, this, this thing now, we now we're, now we're dealing with like, like, wine that's been fermented in this bottle it's under crazy pressure man like 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 it's you could get hurt if i hit you with with this if i shot this cork at you and shook it up so keeping the cage on it this you know this guy and um then loosening the cage and and taking it off with the cork while holding it while keeping my thumb over it and then putting you know typically my um my pointer finger and my ring finger on it at the same time, you know, and then I turn it, I keep it at the 45 degree angle always. And I keep it away from folks. This just prevents me from losing a bunch of wine and having, you know, like having the cork shoot, uh, shoot out. And, you know, like, dude, I've seen the, I, I saw a light get broken once many moons ago. I saw somebody open a bottle and it shot into the ceiling, a roots restaurant and left like a dent in the ceiling um, I had a real asshole that I worked with for a while. Now he's an all right guy, but at the time he's an asshole and he would shoot these, he would shoot champagne corks at people. And it, it's, it's funny, not funny. I, I got a bruise once, man, you know, but like people lost eyes. It's like not, a, it's not a joke. So I'm turning, I'm, I'm holding the cork and I'm, I usually turn the bottle from the bottom and, and relatively slowly, this thing wants to come out. So I'm pushing down on the cork as I'm kind of twisting the bottle away from it, you know, and then, ooh, that was actually pretty loud. Okay. Still at the 45 degree angle and you're going to get like some smoke kind of looking stuff. That's just the CO2 coming in contact with the air. All right. Once again, this has got a lot more pressure. Watch this guys. We're going to pour, pour this and look at the, I mean, if you remember it versus the Prosecco, the mousse on this is is really pretty intense. All right. Oh man. Now, wow. Ooh. I'll get a little bit ahead of this. So Mmm. 
Nice. What are folks saying? Carmen. All right. Russell and Carmen say, we definitely get the apple on that first one. Why you call the pressurized container an autoclave when it's actually a heated pressure cooker for sterilizing? I have no idea why they still still why they why they refer it to. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know why they refer. It. I I think it's I think it because it's pressurized, you know. And I know I think of an autoclave as as like you know I'm baking shit too, you know. And sometimes I just hear people call it a pressurized tank, so I'm kind of rolling with with the terminology that Wine Folly used. If that's right. Love my descri- love my descriptions. Um, and Lisa says, my friend almost lost her eye. Yeah, shit is, shit is real, guys. We, I mean, this is like, we're dealing with a super pressurized thing, right? This is different, though. So when we take this, and we'll notice, like, the, the bubble's a lot more aggressive. I mean, you can, it's, we're, we're, we're bubbling away. Does everybody notice that? So this is a grape called Moussac which is indigenous to southern France. And for this, this is a little bit confusing and technical. This is technically called a blanquette de la mu. So um, I don't know where the phrase blanquette comes from. But in this area, we can also make a wine called cremant de la mu. And um, the cremant, the big difference is, is a, the blanquette de la mu has to use this, the classic grape of this region called moussac. Um, whereas a Blanquette can be, or a Cremant de la Mue could be Chardonnay, predominantly Chardonnay and or Pinot Noir. Um, wow. So this is made, re- this is made in the traditional method, just like a Champagne is. But once again, this kind of Moussac grape, which to me has more of like a kind of Anjou pear quality to it. I get, a, I get like a subtle kind of Mandarin orange thing. And the yeast is more like, like brioche slash kind of pastry-ish yeast. Man, I'm really kind of self-conscious about the weird drinking noises because this is a pretty nice microphone. So, I mean, this is roughly the same. These are roughly the same age. I think um, I, uh, hopefully everybody notices the difference in uh, texture between the two wines. Um, I, I, in my opinion, like this is fresher tasting, um, and it's it's a bit brighter than the prosecco is. I find that a lot with um, you know wines, sparkling wines that go through the uh, secondary fermentation. So we're gonna go back to this this whole traditional method, like how this guy's made. This is different than like like us just throwing Prosecco together, right? And I'm not knocking Prosecco. So after we make the, you know, you know we ferment the wine, this is kind of cool. And this is what's, to me, mind-blowingly crazy when somebody makes a lot of non-vintage, like a non-vintage champagne is there, and we'll taste the non-vintage champagne in a little while. But, you know, somebody is make, putting these base wine together before we, before we, um, start to the fermentation, that secondary fermentation in the bottle, somebody's putting that base wine together and they're figuring out like, okay, I'm going to turn this into sparkling wine by adding yeast and sugar, but I've got to have the blend before that. So that guy's kind of going in or person, I should just say that person's going in a little bit blind in the sense that, um, um, uh, they've got to they've got to make this blend before, and and kind of imagine what the end product's going to be. Typically, about a you know eighteen months or many many more years down the road. And there's the addition of the bubbles and sugar and yeast. So it's it's um there takes a lot of skill for the person doing the blending. And then um, all right. Chris is saying he gets more citrus. Yeah, definitely. I mean, a, the um, when we do the traditional method, there's more CO2. It's it's um, brighter. Um, a lot of times the wines are are picked a bit earlier, so they have more acidity, and they're just grapes that have higher acidity typically than Glera, the Prosecco grape. 
So you do get more of those citrus characters from it, from it too. Mm. And then Carmen notes the cork, and this one is slightly larger in diameter, and um, and was harder to extract. Yeah, because this is because this is made in this this the traditional method, like it's sec it goes through secondary fermentation in the bottle. The wine inside is under way way more pressure than the the um, prosecco is. So we actually have to get they 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 use different corks and they, they use corks that are broader in diameter um, and um, just for that purpose. So they stay in the bottle um, and they usually are kind of, for lack of a better term, ram jammed in there. So, okay, we make our blend, right? And then we do something called tirage, right? Um, which is when we add the yeast and sugar into that bottle. That's this, this part right here, this that I'm circling around, right? And um, this is what gets... Um, this is what gets the bubbles going. It's called the Le Cour de Terrage. Um, and this is this wasn't really, this wasn't perfected until the 19th century. Um, you know, up until like folks like Louis Pasteur and, you know, 19th century scientists really started to understand, to both understand how yeast worked and cultivated it in a manner where they could, you know, make wines on an industrial level in a pretty controlled um, environment. Like champagne is kind of a product of the place it's from. And a lot of sparkling wines are too. Like, like they would, um, you know, people considered wines with bubble init bubbles initially, like it was like, oh, oh shit, this is a mistake. Like, I don't want the wine to have bubbles. And what happened was, is somebody would start making wine um, and then maybe they wouldn't drink all of it in the fall. Like back in the day, man, I mean, like, like human beings were like, oh my God, this is the reason there's wine is like grapes ferment. They just, they just naturally have yeast on them and they start to turn into booze once they get ripe. And you just let them sit there and, and you're going to have booze, man. I mean, it's like one of the few, mo a lot of fruits do it, but grapes were abundant and and got it going the fastest and um, were the easiest to press into a beverage because they're soft. You know, they have all the, it's just, it was, eventually we figured out how to do this seven, 8,000 years ago. But we didn't figure out how to, how the yeast component worked until really the 19th century. So a lot of times you'd start to make wine and, um, you know, it, it, it was warm out, but then it would cool down. And when it got too cold, the yeast just doesn't want to do its job anymore, right? So then it then it goes dormant, and then once it would warm back up, maybe you've put that wine, which at that point was probably still sweet wine, and you'd put it into some other vessel or into a barrel or you've moved it, and all of a sudden, holy shit, there's bubbles. Well, because it we it warmed back up, the like external temperature got warmer, and um and the yeast reactivates. So sometimes this would go through, like we'd make the wine in the fall, it would sit in a cellar, and then in the spring, we'd get sparkling wine again. Well, this especially happened in Champagne because Champagne is very far north. It's uh, at about 50 degrees latitude. So, I mean, further north than, than the Canadian border. So, and, and re relatively temperate in climate. So that's really how, like, like the folks in Champagne initially were like, shit, man, we wish we could make wines without bubble like Burgundy. And eventually over the course of, I'm, you know, I'm paraphrasing this and for brevity's sake, turn it down. Eventually over the course of a couple hundred years, they embraced the whole thing, figured out how to then use yeast to their advantage and bottle wines that were different from those of their neighbor. And there was, uh, especially in the late uh, 18th century, early 19th century, the demand exponentially increased in the courts of Europe. And that champagne was usually pretty sweet in style. Drier and drier champagnes became in favor, yada, yada. So, and they started to realize, and we'll get to the aging part here. So folks started to realize like, man, the longer I let that yeast sit in that bottle, wow, the more, the toastier it is, the richer it tastes, the more we really love some of these flavors. So, um, with, with, in champagne nowadays, minimally a, uh, the, the, the champagne has to be aged 
what's called on the lees, the dead yeast particles, for at least 15 months. So, and this, what we're trying, the Blanquette de Lemieux, isn't from Champagne. Obviously, it's from Lemieux in the southern part of France, but it's made just like a Champagne. And they age this for 15 months, which is a, a, roughly a year longer than the Prosecco spends with the yeast. So there is a yeastier quality to this for sure. Um, hope, wow, that really went to town on this. Okay, any questions about that? I'm really going. My favorite part is, is the drinking though. This to me, what I love about, like the interesting part of this wine interacting with this yeast for all this long time is like, you get a lot of secondary flavors. And to me, they can be like, um, they remind me a lot of like pastries. Um, and uh, like th this is, I'm starting to get just a hint of a honey character to it. But once again, it's not like su the sweetness of the honey, kind of just that, that really heady, almost yeasty, wild character that, that honey, honey has on its own. And this smells like, like, like basic dried flowers too. And a little bit like hay. Mm, man, this is fun. So we bought the rest of this wine from the woman who's an importer out of Madison. And this is, this is normally in the, the $25 a bottle price point. So, and at, at 15 bucks, I've been drinking a lot of this at home because, um, because I love bubble when it's, and it's pretty cheap and really, really good. Um, as it warms up, I'm getting pears more. I like it. Yeah, I mean, this is this has this is cool because we're starting to get in that that place with a lot of um, bottle fermented sparkling wines, where there's like kind of citrus fruit characters and like m and orchard fruit characters at the same time, um, plus the yeastiness. That's one of the, the appeals of sparkling wine, especially made in the traditional method where we're doing the bottle fermentation to have all the yeast aging. They're, they're complex wines. There's a lot going on with them. Um, I kind of went, um, I like your hay description. I can definitely pick up a light grassy note. Will it still be on sale at Rays? Yeah, there, there, we have tons of this. So this, I mean, tons in the relative sense. Like we have cases and cases. I mean, um, I think I've got probably about 10 or 12 cases left. Um, for, so for the next few weeks, we'll definitely have a fair amount of it. I probably won't have it by New Year's though. Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing this so folks find good wines and buy them. So, you know, you can get it through the website or call the store or, or come in to raise, you know? Mm. Questions about that? I, I'll go a little bit to, like this, we see where this is from is Lemieux in super far south of France, whereas, you know, Champagne is way, way up here. Lemieux is way, way down here, you know? Um, so, I, you know, people were making sparkling wine uh, like five, you know, four or 500 years ago in different places. It just, it was, the folks in Champagne are really the ones who who um, knocked it out of the park first and really kind of formalized the whole process and figured out how to best commercialize it. All right, so we did that. I talked about the sparkling thing, uh, like riddling um, is you know taking the um, getting the yeast out of the bottle when we and typically nowadays we freeze the necks and pop the top pop like the, the we 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 top it with like a um, like a beer cap kind of thing and then freeze the yeast that's in the neck and then it the pressure blows it out and then the dosage is the final thing we do which is adding this final amount of um, sugar you know um, and sometimes like a little 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 bit of wine it's usually a little bit of wine and some sugar and sometimes it's really good wine and in the case of rosé champagnes um, it's usually like a red wine which in champagne, in real champagne, like a rosé wine, a lot of times is a mixture of red and white wines, which is unique. In France, champagne is the only place that can do that. 
All right, we talked about poop tree, poop tree. I can never say this. This is the things that we age it in to get the yeast out. It takes about six weeks to really do this the right way. Minimally, some folks do it longer to age it and to put it in here to slowly get the yeast to turn. This is this riddling process. Everybody used to do this by hand for, um, you know, traditional method wines. Um, and, and a lot of really, really ultra like high end and cuvées are still riddled by hand. Um, this is a gyro palette. So somewhere in the mid 20th century, like this does the riddling on its own. And it's this, it's this machine that just goes chicken, 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 chicken. And it like every eight hours or so changes a little bit. So the yeast in the bottle slowly goes down the neck. Delicious, somebody says. Lisa says, why is my bottle already empty? I don't know. You guys drank the whole thing? Yeah, this is this is pretty solid. All right, this is a pretty good show. We, we're showing you the yeast in the bottle here, right, once again. And then the disgorging. This is this looks kind of gr- cruddy, doesn't it? But that's the, that's what once we're, we're – when we're disgorging the wine or after we've riddled it, really, the yeast is just this little plug at the bottom. All right, we talked about Cremant. We did this guy. Here's where Champagne is. And here's a little thing, man. This is what the soil in Champagne looks like. So um, this is what we would call um, – it's, it's a limestone. So Champagne in France, really, the, the word Champagne itself means um, means like field of – like chalky field. Right, because you'll see other regions of, of of France will use the term Champagne in just reference. It's a geographical reference more than it is like, you know, the the name of a place. But it, in this sense, it is. It's both things. It's the name of a place and a reference to its actual geology. So it's a chalky field, and this is because the Champagne region itself was an inland sea millions of years ago, and this beautiful chalky soil does two things. Um, it, it has great drainage, so it doesn't withhold moisture that well because you don't want to grow grapes on soil that are, that stay really wet, right? And folks say the verdict's out, but folks say it kind of lends a mineral quality to the wines themselves. Um, can you make a Blanquette in the Champagne region or would it then be called Champagne? No. So the, the, this, uh, and hopefully I was, uh, Maybe I wasn't explicit enough about this. I apologize. So that the Blanquette de Lemieux is 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 only made in this Lemieux. Uh, I'm answering the question. It's only made in this Lemieux region in uh, southern France, and it's called. Um, I, I don't know what the connotation of the word Blanquette is. I'm so so sorry with that. I'm probably sure it just means like white wine of Lemieux, um, but this is really a sparkling wine that predates Champagne. It's called Blanquette there because it uses that indigenous Muzak grape. Um, when they use like other grapes, they'll call it Cremant de la Mue. Um, so the Blanquette thing is really just, just unique to that small area of um, the Mediterranean coast. It's a very, <laughs> it's a really unique singular wine in France. I love it because it's like, it costs, it, it tastes a lot like a non-vintage champagne at like a third the price a lot of times. Good question. Great, great question. Um, okay. So now what we're going to try is, um, I'm going to open this guy up and this is Panier. Um, Panier Brut. Once again, we see this is Brut. And this is aged three years on the lees. So it's extensively more contact with the yeast. And these are the classic Champagne grape varieties. In Champagne, now there's a few um, uh, outside of Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. There are grapes. There are a few other grapes. There's Cesar... Um, Pinot Blanc. Um, oh boy, I should remember a couple of. Um, there's a couple really, really unique uh, minor grape varieties that are available in Champagne, but really they make up less than like like one percent of the whole vineyard. The all the vineyards. Really, the stars are Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. This shows you um, 
you know, this is this is composed of the the panier brut is those three grape varieties. You know, some of you might know Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier are are red grape varieties. Well, how do we get white wine from red grape varieties? We press the skins very. We're really gentle when we make the wine. When we press, because the juice inside those red grapes is actually a clear a white juice, and in Champagne we're very very gentle. Once again, I took the uh, the foil off, and I've got the you know we were here at this point where I undid the um, the cage, and I've got the cork and the cage together, the wire, the cage, and then I'm gonna gonna keep this at a, remember the 45 degree angle, and man, this cork really really wants to come out. You folks that were down that opened this probably noticed that too, right? And I'm really, really slowly. And if I push down on the cork while I pull it out, like that's even louder than it should be. I can do these and have them be really quiet. But to me, the, the fun is trying to make it as quiet as can be. I know I know there's a ceremonial pop, but... Um, uh, and then we're going to pour this guy. Look at that. I mean, even more just total head on this guy. Moose. Oh, really bright. Kind of chalky on the nose, too. Very much like a... <laughs> it's always silly when I say this. It's kind of got a French toast vibe to it. It's very, like, brioche. Has a real toasty quality. Kind of remi reminds me a lot of like marzipan and almonds. Um, I get the green apple thing on this too, right, right out. And I get like a poached pear. And sometimes champagne smells vaguely like, like in a good way, like really good maraschino cherries. And there's definitely like a chalky character to this on the nose. Oh, I, I kind of did the, it's a joke at, in the office here, little, little insider info. When you pour yourself like a huge glass of something, like, and it's really, you really should just be doing a sample. We call that the home pour. <laughs> like you're at home at your house, but you should just be sampling the wine, but you're like, oh no, no, no. I love you so much. Eat in my belly. Home pour. I kind of home poured this. Mm. Wow. Bradley Wells. Wow, this thing was turbocharged and bubbles like crazy. Yeah, I mean, man, like, like, once again, I mean, what this is a big difference. We'll, we'll see this a textural difference between, you know, wines that are done in the traditional method versus the tank. This is way really really bubbly. So this is aged three years on lease. So it's twice as long with that yeast as the Blanquette was. And it's, it really has what I would call secondary aromas, meaning like, like, like flavors that aren't just primary fruit characters, uh, aromas and flavors that aren't just the primary fruit that we get out of wine, not in still wines or, or young wines. So once a wine ages, it starts to develop these things. And the beauty of a lot of, uh, most champagne and, 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 and high quality sparkling wines is that they've got some age on them. This is made, this is the first wine we're making that's made, or having, that's made from a variety of different years, too. So it's what we would call non-vintage, meaning it doesn't just come from one year. Um, and a lot of times with a non-vintage champagne, um, they'll, they might add something that's like five, six, you know, up to ten years old. That's a, that's a still wine that they've had their, had, a, had around for a while that has some real nutty, deep, super rich flavors and adds a little uh, older character to the wine. Oh man, pretty good, right? Oh, whoa, that was my last slide. I was really flying through here. And I guess it's six o'clock right now too. I think I covered how we make these things pretty well. Um, and I didn't get super deep into the history of champagne itself. 
I do want folks to realize, like, when we look at France, like, like to give you an idea of where, where we, ah, uh, ah, yeah, oh, this is really good, yeah, there is a certain benefit from sticking your nose deep into a flute of this one, Belch, <laughs> this is what I'm talking about, though, like, like, that's the beauty of the white wine glass for the champagne versus, like, the flute, like, it's when you have a flute, it's really like, like, like the wine isn't interacting with oxygen as much as it is in a, in a, um, slightly wider, um, glass. Now, if we put this in a red wine glass, like something really big, the problem though there is that we start to lose a lot of the bubbles and, and there's more bubbles dissipating on the surface and it can have a kind of sharp character if it's in a really big glass. So like a classic white wine glass is kind of just right for, for good sparkling wines. Um, yes, you covered the info. <laughs> oh, fabulous. What's the best temperature for serving these? Ah, the Pennier flavors are really nice after it is warmed up. Okay, so... Um, and I, I, sorry, I didn't really talk about this too much. So, so Champagne Panier, so this is the, you know, this is the actual champagne we're drinking, Panier. Panier is what we call a negotiant, meaning they're a champagne producer that buys, um, that buys grapes, um, and from a variety of different farmers and makes, you know, makes the wine from source fruit and a combination of vineyards that they own. Um, I, I think... To me, like champagne's one of the things, one of the few white wines I like to be pretty cold. Um, but then again, like at, at, when they're older and have some age on them, um, like I think, like in the you know, uh, like fifty degrees ish is pretty good. Forty five, maybe. I think um, y- you know, I do like. I, I, I'm with you, Bradley. Where like as it warms up, man. You start to get those real brioche, nutty, nutty flavors come out more, and they're more volatile at warmer temperatures. Uh, oh, hi. Oh, Christine Hansen, how are you? Good. What's the point of sabering? Oh, wait, hold on. Sorry. Carmen, um, oh, we are scientists, though, so we tried both. We are listening to you. <laughs> And then Christine Hansen, who is a, a journalist who writes about wine. I am, I, and a friend. Say hi to Tony. Hope you guys are both enjoying this. Um, what's the point of sabering? Oh, man, that's a really, um, oh, sorry. I was, I was just showing folks the label of the, all right. All I was showing people were, was the label of the champagne. Just, you know, showing you this is Panier Champagne. I really didn't talk too much about it. Um, Damn, I'm getting barraged with the questions. Okay, Christine, good to see you. Um, Sabering is like, instead of opening up the wine with the cork, we like, people usually use like kind of like swords and stuff and they take, they get the wine really, really cold and you, um, you kind of, you kind of, like most champagne bottles, well, and this is going on forever, and I could talk forever about this, and there's no way you're going to see this, but like all champagne bottles have a seam, and you, what you can do is you can pop the cork off w- before you open it. You can like literally break the neck by, by putting some pressure on like the seam of the bottle, and then you kind of score it, and then you get the neck really, really, really cold, and um, and then you keep it at a that forty five degree angle. But then you hit it. You got to get the neck super, super, super cold. The whole thing's got to be super cold, and you hit it with the um, cork still on, but the foil part all off. So I would like do like this. I would take this whole thing off, and then and then I yeah I'd like take the whole damn thing off. And then I would literally, you can do this with like a, like a, um, man, you can even do this with like a, like, like I've seen people do it with a, with a, um, bread knife, man. So, and then you hit that, you get it super cold and then you score where there's an imperfection in the glass 
and then you hit it at the top at like about a 45 degree, like at a 45 degree angle, and you hit it with the back side of, of something that like a knife, right? But you could do it with anything that's metal and really strong, and you slide it up and hit it, and then the pressure inside pops the, you know, pops the top off. Um, it's kind of a parlor trick thing, you know? Um, I'm a, I gotta say, I've, I've got about a 70% chance of actually doing it on the first try. <laughs> and I've only had one weird mishap, and it's because I popped it off and then I dropped the bottle at the same time, which was a real mess. And, you know, I, I will chalk it up to I was kind of drunk when it happened. Um, when are you ship? Oh, wait, yeah, we already did that. I tried to show you guys the label that it was the Pontier we were drinking. What are you going to do with the remainder of the bottles? Come on now, dog. You know what I'm going to do with the remainder of these bottles. Come on, man. I mean, that's, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to drink these. <laughs> Not all of them, but I'm definitely taking the champagne out. Um, hey, any questions? Like, I, I know I, I, this is, this feel, felt really fast and furious. Um, to elaborate a little bit more on champagne as a region, um, Oh, can you recommend a sparkling wine that may be better and or more economical than a champagne? Oh, so, I mean, basically that's what I was trying to do with the Prosecco and the Blanquette. So that Blanquette de Lemieux that I showed you, the Antec Blanquette de Lemieux, um, I mean, I think that's that's kind of at a pretty close quality to a uh, non-vintage champagne for roughly, you know, a third to a half the price. Um, also, cavas from Spain are made in the same way, and those can be as inexpensive as $10. That's cava, C-A-V-A. -A. Oh, shoot. Yeah, I promise by next week, like next week, Tuesday or Wednesday, I'll have a couple other um, wine classes up on the website, and we'll send everybody email. Um, I'm going to do a, uh, a master sommelier uh, named Dan Pilkey. I've got something lined up with him that we're going to do on November 28th um, with Paul Hobbs Imports, which are, we're going to do a uh, wine from Argentina, a wine from Cahor in southern France, and a, white, and a red wine from Armenia, um, which is actually really cool. Um, How do I store my bubbles for tomorrow? Shit, that's right. Okay, hold on. So a couple things here, man. And this is what I really, this is what I should have done. And I um, I should have put this with the kit on the website. And it was like a hindsight's 2020. And I, I didn't think about it because I have a million of these things at home. So I hope everybody can kind of see this. This is like a little, I got like a little champagne stoppery guy. And it, watch this. This guy just, it's like a little sheath guy. And it goes like that, right? And it fits over the top. These are beautiful. We sell these and they're like six bucks. And if I were, you know, smarter than I actually am, I would have put this as an optional thing to purchase with the kit. Because now you got three sparkling wines open and you're like, what am I going to do? I got to drink like 70 ounces of, you know, like bubbles in the next day or something. Nonetheless, is everybody seeing that? Um, oh boy, man, we're getting lots of, lots of, um, lots of questions. So the other thing though, like, you know, you can take an old cork and kind of ram jam it in there if you're good, good at it. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Like this guy is like, really look at, look at this. I'm like, and that was just an old red wine cork. It'll probably stay in there. And I would put these in your fridge, but I would stand them up for sure. Got it? Cool. Some people will use a spoon, like, like too. That's a, that's an old, like, old trick, too. And that'll keep the, supposedly it's supposed to keep the balls. I've never had to do that. But, like, ta-da, I just used the old cork, too. Good answer. Um... Ooh, how do you feel about, uh, what's your favorite kava? Oh man, I'm a little guilty and, and it's really something. I, well, the kava I drink a ton of, and I'll write this is, uh, 
favorite. I'm writing what my favorite kava. Favorite kava for twenty dollars is um, Juve Ecomps Rose. Love love the Juve Ecomp Rose for twenty bucks. Um, We've got something for at 10, 10 bucks, uh, Moss Fee. It's called Moss Fee. Moss Fee Kava. It's pretty damn good. Okay, I'm trying to keep up with the questions. How do you feel about Bubbles from America? What do you recommend? What do you think of Gruet? Um, I, I, I would say um, before I worked at Ray's, I worked for the uh, the – wholesaler that sold the Gruet wines and they're from New Mexico. And that's a long, I mean, we'd be here for hours, but they're, I think Gruet uh, makes sparkling wines and they're pretty good. Um, I, I hands down have to say the, the sparkling wine overall in the whole universe that I probably drank the most in the last two or three years is Rotor Estate. And that I'll say that, that um, I'll, I'll write that my favorite American producer I love Rotor Estate from Mendocino in California. It's roughly $21, $22. Um, I think that's the best sparkling wine value in the world. Um, I, I always, I, I measure everything else against their, their just a state brute that's like 22 bucks. Um, they barrel age the reserve wines. I'm pretty sure they're, the, the standard release is roughly three years old before they put it out. Um, okay. Uh, did I cover all this? Um, I'm the guy you sold one of those caps to a few hours ago, but we'll be finishing all these tonight. <laughs> Classic. Uh, is there a special way to swizzle champagne versus wine in your mouth to bring the flavors out? Ooh, damn dog. That's a good question. I guess, I don't know, man. God, I, I, I never thought about that. I guess I don't do the, the, it's called retro nasal breathing. Hold on. Oh, I still do that when I taste it. Like kind of, you like you're sucking air in, like, like and having it go over the top, and it kind of bubbles everything up. Oh, I didn't realize I do it, but I totally do that. Yeah. Oh man, and the the champagne is like totally super nutty when you do that. Mm. Oh, this is great. Oh my god. Um. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? I'm going to wrap this up because I'm going, I try to keep these to about an hour. So, um, and I, I, sorry if I didn't really cover the deep, deep history of Champagne, the region itself, but I think we showed a pretty wide swath of styles and we can see why um, bottle fermented or, you know, like traditional methods, um, sparkling wines are, are, are more expensive and they, they cost more to make and they're usually aged a lot longer. Um, and Champagne, the region in of itself has some pretty unique properties going on. Um, and the wine, there's a built in quality there with making them minimally aged the wines 15 months on the yeast before they release them. Most producers greatly exceed that. Um, hence, you know, these wines taste, take, you know, upwards of two years typically before they're released and the folks have to hold on to them and age them for that long before they come out. And there's all the, um, the costs associated with, uh, going through the secondary fermentation in the bottle, um, you know, and the riddling and everything else. So that's, it's kind of how the why why champagnes and, uh, bottle fermented sparkling wines outside of champagne really do have a little bit of a premium cost associated with them. Thank you, Nate, for making my night, night. Lisa, oh, say hi to Bob. Ugh, oh, miss you. I mean, I see you once in a while in the store, but, you know, we're all going to get through this. I'm going to get a little, a little verklempt if I drink anymore. And, uh, 
yeah, really appreciate everybody, you know, doing this. I'll, I'm going to put up a couple classes um, next week. Um, and thank, thanks, everybody, so much for tuning in. My buddy Eric's going to help me. I'll give it, like, another – I'll give it to, like, 620, and if there's any other questions, I'll answer those, and then we'll we'll log off in between then. I'm going to talk to my guy Eric over here, drink some more bubbles – Chin Chin, thanks everybody for coming um, and checking this out. I'm always up for feedback. If you think I should change anything or do it a different way, um, I in in a perfect world, I'm gonna put up like, hey kid, you think we should put up PDFs of the the yeah? I think I'm gonna put PDFs up of the powerpoints, so on the website. So if you want them, they're kind of there in posterity. At this point, I kind of use the PowerPoints as my own notes. All right. Um, oh, have you ever had... All right, man. Here's this Chris dude. Have you ever had Comte de Dampier champagne? It is the best I've ever had. The cage is hand-tied from twine without knots. I ask partially because I want to see if I can find it again. Dude, my guy, I don't know this. Um, you know, Chris, uh, uh, dude, feel free to email me <laughs> with <laughs> questions or requests at NATE at Riz. All right, man. There you go, dude. Yeah. Um, oh, Kelly Mangan. Um, you say sparkling goes with any food. What are the best foods to serve with it? Oh, man. For sure. Um, oh, you know, seriously? Like popcorn <laughs> and French fries are so great with bubbles. As are potato chips. Like potato chips is, is are just out of this world. Like like that's that I know how dumb that sounds, but totally. Um, I'm talking anything, and like when you have like a like a older like this champagne has got that kind of yeasty thing. It's actually good with steak, you know. Like um, like I love 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 Japanese food, and it's not weird for me to have like champagne and sushi. I mean like that's 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 like that's like my last 10 birthdays have probably been champagne and sushi. Um, once again, when I do do champagne and sushi though, I, I try to avoid anything that's like a wasabi bomb or really, really spicy. Cause that kind of can detract. It can, it can, it can accentuate some bitterness in the wine. Um, but that's, that's a favorite of mine. Um, I definitely like like soul or trout or I love smoked trout with champagne too. It's like smoked trout is a big, big, big fave. Um, Bradley, man, thank you, brother. Like good to see you in the store once in a while. Um, barbecue lamb riblets are hot. Barbecue lamb riblets sound pretty good, man. In fact, like when I, before I worked at Ray's, I, I did, I, I, I worked for a, a importer um, and I worked for a wholesaler slash importer. And I was lucky enough to be the guy that did like most of the wine dinners for the company. And whenever anybody had like, whenever a chef would just throw me some super fucked up dish, I can't even remember where it was, but there was sometimes some dude had like a, a Chilean sea bass with like basically some kind of fucking super weird guacamole on it. And I was not going to hate on the dude to his face, but it was, it, it made the dish made sense like, and was good in execution. But I was just like, Oh my God, what wine do I throw at this? And, and funny that somebody brought, I just, I had like, I just was like, Oh God, it's just going to be some, I'm going to throw a brute, non-vintage sparkling wine that's dry at it and it'll be perfect and and people like after the dinner everybody said oh my god i couldn't believe how great the the champagne went with the with went, went with that crazy sea bass with avocado and i was just like yeah i mean i did it because it was the only thing i could think of that would work <laughs> for sure um 
I've heard chicken, probably my favorite food on earth, is amazing with champagne because it cuts through the fat richness. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, I, I, get, I guess one thing, I think as Americans, like, like and, and this is not me knocking our culture. It's just kind of a, it's just my observation is, like, we want to be like, A goes with B always because robot just because A should go with B. Everything should be peanut butter and jelly. Well, like, like, I don't want to narrow down chicken because like going with champagne always because like, dude, fried chicken is like a totally different animal than like, you know, something that's like, I I don't know, in a soup or something. You know what I mean? Like, like the fat and richness of chicken varies from, you know, I, I guess what I'm getting at is like, like I think about food and wine pairings a lot about the preparation of the protein and the, um, the acidity and like if there's a sauce with it or if it's fried or something like that to me is maybe even more important than like the origin or what type of protein it is. But yeah, Whatever, man, for sure. Like any fucking chicken in the world will be good with champagne, though, in the end. Yeah, or just dry bubbles. I'm going to wrap this up, dude, my man. These were really good questions. This was this was really pretty cool. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, Chris, I really appreciated your, man, how, how much you got down on this. I'm going to wrap it up. My guy, Eric, wants to go home. I, he's just itching. He's like, he's got to like do some D&D or something. <laughs> or whatever Eric's going to do, man. It's like Magic the Gathering. I'm getting rips on Eric now. I'm roasting him. Hey, thank you, everybody. Uh, take care. I'm going to mute this. <laughs> I just end the stream, right? Stop streaming. Hey, adios. Chin chin. Thanks for the bubbles.